So I am super excited to be here. This is not our typical uh, SANS webcast, right? Where we do a bunch of uh, vendor fun. Uh, I'm not saying those are bad. Those are awesome too. We get a lot out of those. I know I do. Uh, learning about you know, solutions and spaces and all that. Today, we're actually going to do something quite a bit different. Um, we are actually looking at uh, packet capture um, and we're going to play along at home or while well, you could play along at home. I should probably go ahead and forward up the slide here. Um, it turns out that uh, there's a public repo on GitHub. If you want the packet captures and the excerpts of the HTTP log files, um, you have them here. As a matter of fact, you know what I ought to do here? I ought to go grab these. By the way, if you're looking at this and going, how is he going to do an hour with 15 slides, right? The answer is we're, we're not going to be on the slides a lot because that's, I don't want to say lame, but uh, let's see here. Did that make it? There we go. Okay. So I just put in the chat um, the uh, the link. If you want to go grab the packet captures, um, you can now, uh, well, I mean, they're, they're yours, right? Uh, do what you want with them. Um, but uh, again, no customer information. Like, obviously, these are all created in a clean room. Um, but uh, that said, right, we do want to highlight some of the stuff that we find packet capture, uh, well, very useful for, right? Um, and so I do want to do a quick overview of HTTP as we get going. Uh, then we'll talk about a couple of case studies in HTTP PCAP analysis. Now, I've chosen these specifically because these are places than incident response investigations, right? Which I have done a ton of, and I'm sure will continue to be dragged into uh, for, I, I suspect, eternity, right? I, I think that's probably going to be my, my, my penance, right? I'll go, you know, someplace, uh, you know, purgatory or something, right? Incident response for the next multiple millennia or whatever, who knows? Anyway, uh, but uh, alas, I want to talk about these things that I bump up against. We've got web server logs and a lot of folks are like, okay, now tell me what happened. And I'm like, I have bad news for you. Let's talk about what does and doesn't get logged in your web server logs. And I'm like, so you can't tell me whether or not the SQL injection was successful. I'm like, well, sometimes, right? Talk a little about that. Likewise, oh my gosh, cross-site scripting. This one's total fun, right? I mean, not, not for the victims, obviously, but, but from an analysis standpoint, and we'll talk about why some of these get super difficult. Um, and then we'll also look at web shell communications because those are super interesting. The really cool part about web shell uh, communications is that not every command is successful. So even when we do have some of the commands in the web server logs, um, we uh, we may not uh, yeah may may not have those. And I'm seeing uh, two people now are saying no sound. Uh, do I not have? I'm going to open up here see if I'm getting side text. Carol, can you confirm you're hearing sound? Yes, I can hear you fine. Okay, perfect. Because there's two people in the questions. That's why I was, uh, okay, I hear some other folks, so I hear fine. Okay, so this is just a technical issue um, and it's being reported and awesome. Okay, I've got two other people like I can hear you fine and Carol, so we're gonna keep right on rocking. So these are the things that I say the things. We'll say some of the greatest hits around where, <clears throat> basically uh, some of the greatest hits uh, around places where PCAP answers questions that my HTTP server or something, HTTP server, right? web server, log files can't, right? And so uh, obviously I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about Endace quickly here, right? I've been working with Endace for, uh, work with Endace for, yeah, for a while. I'm actually gonna drop something in the chat here. Um, I'm not sure what is happening with some users. Audio, but most, you're okay. If you can't, please disconnect and rejoin. Okay, the wonders of technology. Right? So I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Endace. Uh, we've been working together a while. Uh, there's actually another SANS uh, webcast with Endace where we talk about looking at packet capture with Hafnium, uh, as well as uh, you know, SolarGate, or the SolarWinds you know, compromise. Um, th there were lots of places, SolarWinds specifically, right, where having that packet capture available, uh, network capture in general available was 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 pivotal, right? Uh, it, obviously, in understanding whether or not you, uh, you know, had some follow on uh, or any follow on uh, activity uh, there. And so that was a, uh, you know, that that obviously was was interesting. We talked a lot about Endace's probe. Um, so Endace has a has a product effectively that, that is a probe that that helps you. Uh, basically democratize uh, the packet capture space, right? So um, instead of needing a tap with like 
umpteen different, uh, and I'm, I'm way underselling the product here. Go back, watch the other, uh, the other, you know, webcast here. Um, but uh, you know, rather than needing, you know, a tap to go uh, to 12 different products, all of which need PCAP uh, or, or packet data, basically endases is a record once, replay as many times as, or to as many destinations as you need. Uh, product it has Wireshark built into it for analysis. Like it, it's, it's pretty sick, right? So that said, um, I'm not going to be using it here because. Um, again, this was all you know set up in, in, in clean room. Um, and also with the Wireshark that you're using there, effectively you're using it through like a VNC UI, which is outstanding when I have packet capture that I have you know already on the probe. But here, since we have these standalone files, it's actually easier for me to do it um, in, in my standalone uh, standalone Wireshark. So I'm gonna walk through how to dissect some of this, how to work through some of these investigations. Without further ado, let, let's go let's go rock this. So that said. Quick overview of HTTP. HTTP is a stateless protocol. Uh, communication uses verbs. Typically, we see get or post. There are a few others. I, you know, I mean, certainly we see prop find and we see, uh, gosh, what options, put, delete, head. You know, there's there's a few others, right? But it, it's it's pretty universal that the get and post are the the big ones that we see in, in server logs. And and by the way, too, in in the vast majority of investigations, are the ones we're going to focus on. We could spend hours talking about nuances of, of HTTP, but, but again, we're, we're just not going to. Uh, there's a number of response codes. Again, I could spend a lot of time focusing on that. I, I think there's probably stuff you can go find on that, and you should. Um, and, and then, of course, headers. Now, uh, the browser sends one or more headers. But we'll take a look at a couple of these in a minute. Uh, but, and this is key, this is one of the keys that I'd like you to kind of highlight in on um, you know, around logs, because when we talk about investigations, right? Um, you know, we always look at what is our best evidence, right? And, and a web server log, a lot of folks are like, that's best evidence. And, and, and in some cases, it might be. Um, in other cases, not so much, right? Because as we see here on the slide, we know that the Git variables are, are recorded, right? So our Git parameters are recorded in our web server logs. The posts are not, right? So any variables passed via post request don't even get logged. Now, this is by design. Right? A lot of folks are like, oh my gosh, some folks have taken away from this. Like, How do I turn on post variable? Don't do it. This is a compliance nightmare. Right? When you go and submit a username and password, for instance, right, and log in, that is almost universally a post request. And if it's not, go slack your developer, right? Because absolutely, right, that is a nightmare um, from a you know from a compliance standpoint, non-repudiation standpoint, if all your passwords are getting logged in, well, what it's plain text or encoded in some way as they're being sent. I mean, that could be encoded client side JavaScript, right? So game on there. Basically, the, the, the takeaway being like, hey, post requests or post variables, the request itself is logged, the variables are not. The variables are probably the most interesting thing, right? Think about a login page, right? <clears throat> See the login, I saw you did the login, who did the login? I don't know, right? Because the post variables aren't logged. Right. Um, so, and of course, there are response codes. And again, I want to highlight here that headers, any additional headers other than the user agent, uh, which describes what browsers and use, typically are not logged either. Right. Okay. So, <clears throat> let's take a look at some packet capture to kind of highlight through this. And I'm going to ask here uh, if somebody can just drop into the chat here and say, yes, you do see Wireshark. Right. Before I'm like, yeah, is that, does that work? Maybe you've seen Wireshark. I want to make sure it's not just showing slides here. I'll assume for the moment that everybody can see Wireshark. And if you can't, uh, that you're like, hey, right? Let's uh, go here. Okay, I see. I can see it. Done. There we go. I'll stop begging for people to. Okay, winning. Okay. So I'm going to start in with HTTP requests. Right. So uh, what you're going to see here effectively is that <clears throat> basically we've got a number of uh, number of requests. I'm going to right click over here. Uh, we'll grab one of these in. Let's see. We'll say here, and I'm going to do a follow. And when you do the follow here, there's two options here, TCP and HTTP streams. And I'll, I'll show you the difference here in just a second. And this is, again, our, our Git request. Right? Um, so <clears throat> let me go follow the TCP stream. Let me pull this over here. I'll make this all big. Um, I want to show you here first, uh, basically, the request. We see here the verb, the Git. Right? Um, then we also see here specifically, what is it looking for? It's looking for themes.php. This question mark here actually divides the excuse me, basically divides uh, the basically the uh, URI, the request, uh, basically with any variables, right? So here we only have one variable, dir equals uh, var, uh, var dub dub dub. Right? Uh, now, if there were additional variables, you'd see an ampersand here. In fact, let's go see if we can find one that's got a little bit better. In Wireshark here, by the way, if you've used a uh, basically 
use a request or use something here. Basically, you can come back and say, okay, HTTP request, right? You don't have to go type it in again. So it's in the handy, like most recently used drop down box here. And let's see, I feel like, hey, there we go. Let's do this one. Uh, so we'll do a follow TCP stream there. Okay, that's a better example, right? Um, and so here we can see again the delineation between the requested uh, the requested page as well as any arguments. And notice here there's an ampersand, and this separates the <clears throat> student separates um, the uh, basically any variable uh, variables here. We have two variables. One is dir, um, and the other one is the command. Right now, notice here that uh, as well we we have some basically some URL encoded uh, URL encoded strings. Uh, so if you take a look here, percent two f. If you're not familiar with URL encoding, um, you can always do handy stuff like uh, let's see here. Can we? Yeah, cool. So let's do this. So we'll drop into Python, and I know there are like infinitely better. Way oh my goodness! Right, I don't have that alias yet. Anyway, um, so <clears throat> so what you can do is you can say uh, chr zero x two f, right? Because that's what we saw up here was the two f. Now again, I know there are infinitely better ways to, or easier ways to do this. Python is my co-pilot, right? So um, that that's just my, you know, Python's my co-pilot. And again, I still see people popping in here with no audio. I'm not sure what's going on with uh, uh, with go to uh, go to webinar today, um, but uh, obviously there's there's a couple issues, pop technical issues. If you don't have audio, please drop in um, and drop out. Uh, if some, Carol, if you can repeat that message in the uh, in the chat, I'd appreciate it. Because as I say, like. As I say this, like I realize nobody can hear me anyway. Yeah, rejoining fixed audio for me, perfect. Okay, um, so if I do a chr zero x two f, you can see the slash, right? So that basically is is saying, hey, go ask you decode this back into a character. Right? So the percent two f or the zero x two f is the hex code for a, a forward slash, right? Um, so anyway, okay. Um, so a couple of other a uh, couple of other points here. Uh, <clears throat> basically, we have the host header. Um, there are additional, uh, basically additional. Uh, headers here, DNT, basically do not track. User agent again gets logged, right? But remember, the rest of this generally doesn't. My browser also says, hey, here are the content types I'm ready to accept. Uh, it also says, hey, uh, where did you come from? That's the refer, right? Um, and so again, your browser probably will send this, but there are security tags that prevent this. That's actually probably worth mentioning here. Um, some websites now are using uh, using some uh, referrer tags with a content security policy um, that basically prevent the referrer from being sent as you as you leave one site and go to another. This is good from a privacy protection standpoint. And by the way, the referrer um, sometimes has uh, additional information in it as well. Um, and so the referrer, again, picture for a moment here, right, that this information or sensitive and this is where I came from. If all that data is sent with the referrer, and, and again, with content security policy, a site administrator can say whether or not they're gonna send a referrer at all, and if they do, are they gonna send any parameters with it as well, right? Now, you can imagine why this would be really useful. When somebody comes to my website from Google, I, I really wanna know what they searched to come there, right? That's, that's exceedingly helpful to me, and Google provides that, right? Um, and there are other cases where you know, again, if, if the website was poorly put together and there's sensitive data, let's say like a, uh, let's say a token, for instance, right, an auth token um, in the URI that gets sent over, that, that that's bad juju, right? Um, also notice over here, it says accept encoding gzip, okay? As well, my accept language. Now, um, I, I'm gonna tell you, like there's a reason this just says English, cause I, I don't, I'm not good with any other languages besides English, right? Uh, anything else, Google Translate's got to help me out, right? And and that's that's just the reality. I mean, I read about yay much Korean, speak about yay much as well, um, and uh, you know a couple other languages there. But like you providing me a website in any other language is worthless. Um, now, why does that matter here? Right? Well, what matters the, the reason this matters um, is that if I have an internationalized website, and I can go in and say uh, internationalized website and you know, I have somebody coming in and their browser uh, language, preferred language is let's say Mandarin, um, and my website is internationalized and can provide Mandarin, it will just do so automatically, right? That's fantastic, right? And the browser is telling it like, hey, provide me the Mandarin copy in preference to the English copy. I'm just saying like, it's English, right? Like, that's it, right? Because anyway, um, so, so got all that. By the way, um, if, if you're looking for some interesting analysis, 
um, of folks targeting, uh, you know, let's say targeting a site or uh, th this is a fantastic thing to look at. I, I can't tell you how often uh, we find some interesting, we'll call anomalous patterns um, in some of the language declarations, right? So this is one of these little OPSEC things that people forget about. Now, again, worth noting, this doesn't get logged in your web server logs by default. I don't see an issue with turning this on post variables. Again, just, just don't do that. And we'll come back and look at those in, in a few minutes here. Now, you'll notice here the data that we get back. If you're not familiar with this follow TCP stream thing going on, uh, basically the red is what we sent. That's uh, from the client side. Uh, the blue is, is, is what got sent back, right? So first off, we see a 200, uh, 200 status code. And that says, hey, uh, that means the request was processed. Okay. But now here's where things take a little bit of a dive, right? We have content encoding GZIP. Okay, well, this is great from a, you know, compression, uh, save internet bandwidth, especially mobile bandwidth, right? This is outstanding, but, and, and here's the key, I don't read GZIP, right? And I can't just copy and paste this, this in and be like, gunzip this or gunzip, whichever, I don't know how many folks are gunzip versus uh, gunzip, but gunzip guy from back in the day. Uh, you know, the bottom line here, um, I can't just copy and paste this because, and this is key, right? Uh, let's see if we come over here to hex. Yeah, you can see here that uh, most of these periods, right, uh, or not all of these periods are the same, right? So we see a bunch of period, period, whatever. Well, that just means non-printable, you know, basically not non-printable uh, on a single, basically in a single line space character, right? Some of these are, for instance, line feeds. Um, some of the other dots are simply uh, not 7-bit ASCII. And if you're not familiar with the term 7-bit ASCII, uh, you probably know that a, that a byte goes from 0 to 255. 7-bit um, <clears throat> ASCII basically means that the high order bit is clear, right? So if you look at this, uh, this 9 echo, for instance, you can see that corresponds to a dot at the end there. If you look at the 9 echo, uh, 9 is the high order nibble. Right. And so uh, in order for the high order bit to be clear, that means this high order nibble has to be zero to seven. If it's eight through F, right? So if this character is eight through F, it's non-printable ASCII, right? Or if you've ever catted that out to the you know a terminal screen, um, then that's that's where it goes beep, beep, and it gets all mad at you and all that. It looks like a bunch of gremlins, right? It's kind of the, the term or happy faces or, or whatever. Anyway, bottom line, there you go. That that's the that's that's the takeaway. Okay. Um so Basically, I, I can't because of that. I can't just go copy this, um, you know, this ASCII out and be like, let's go gun zip that, right? I mean, I could if I really wanted to be like, be like, oh, okay, let me go and copy all this hex and then I'll parse that out and write it out raw and the whole and don't do that because that is a horrible plan. There is a much better. There are multiple better plans, right? The first one that I want to throw out here is export objects, right? So you'll notice here that there are a number of different objects that you can export. HTTP being one of them. And you can see here as well, um, <clears throat> yeah, so, uh, and, and again, Carol, if, if you can just repeat the message here, or join or answer some of the questions around the audio, I'd, I'd super appreciate that. Obviously, there, there's a, there is definitely a go to training, or sorry, go to meeting, a webinar, or whatever you want to call it, audio fun today, right? Tech, tech land, right? Okay, um, so we can go through and export objects if, if we so desire. Um, and so you can say, for instance, let's go ahead and save this. And we'll just create a new folder and we'll call this this guy here the uh, I don't know new tool. Um, and then we'll go save this out, right? And so then if I come in and say, hey, let's go over to my new folder, blah, blah, blah. and I can right click over here and say, like, hey, let's go take a look at what's there. And now you can see indeed that uh, well, first off, you can see the content that got returned, right? Um, and so I don't have to go and go through and gun zip that. And of course, now if you're looking at that, you're like, man, that's laborious, right? Like, I don't want to have to go export. There must be a better way. Wireshark must be able to do this. If you're thinking that, first off, you're right. Let's, let's go there. Um, so you're right. Uh, let's go ahead then and we will right click and so oh, yeah, not there. We will close that and then we will right click and we'll say follow. Uh, clear. Let's go grab this guy and we're going to say follow. Garbage. HTTP. There we go. Uh, follow HTTP stream, right? So, I mean, it only took three tries, right? So then we're set. So I'm going to go follow HTTP stream. And now you'll notice that even though, uh, again, we see the same request, basically what Wireshark is doing is it, it's doing what it did during the export. 
And instead of showing me the raw GZIP data, it's showing what's under the hood, right? Which is what I really wanted to see anyway. Now, if you're following along at home and you're like, hey, I don't have that option, you're probably on an older version of Wireshark, right? And that, that's, that's probably it. You're probably sitting in some Linux image that somebody else built. And But if you're, again, you, know, you, you probably should see this as, as fairly, uh, you know, fairly identical with the, with the follow HTTP stream. So that's the GZIP versus the uh, basic GZIP versus, uh, versus not, right? Um, okay, uh, so got that. Let's see. But close that. And then I'm going to hop back over to slides here for a minute and let's talk about. I was going to hop back over to slides. Let's see where are they? There we are. Let's so hop back over to slides here. And now that we've talked a little bit of HTTP, I, I'm going to talk quickly about impediments to HTTP analysis. First off, we've already talked about this. Log files don't collect post variables. And again, this is by design, right? Uh, multiple security breaches have come out of. Uh, logging post variables. And, and sometimes developers do this for debugging reasons. And I get it, right? Trust me, I get it. Um, but this is a dangerous, dangerous game to play um, because, you know, when you log those post variables in production, um, you are absolutely killing non repudiation because um, you're already logged on your Git variables, right? If you log your post variables too, you have the plain text passwords. You just do, right? If you're doing PCI work or right, you're doing credit card work, you have the credit card numbers. Uh, that, that's just a reality, right? Um, and so that obviously is, is not a place that your compliance officer wants you to be in. Um, and so this is one of these great spots where, uh, you know, or spots where with, with great power comes great responsibility, something, something. Um, HTTPS and encryption make packet capture harder to operationalize. There is no question about this, right? Um, before we had perfect forward secrecy with TLS and, and became really a, a thing with TLS 1.3, right? A uh, big thing, right? Um, you know, we could go back through a very laborious process if it was our server and we had the private the certificate, right? We could go and, and decrypt the private key. The certificate. We go back and we could decrypt, uh, you know, the, the sessions. And with PFS, we just can't, right? There are, now I'm positive there's some reply guy hanging out here that's going to be like, Jake's wrong. You totally can do that. And, and, and yes, you can, but you have to store the, the session keys someplace, right? So PFS requires you to store the individual session keys someplace, which means you have to log them at time of, of, of traffic generation. That's not a reality for most folks, right? So, so I'm, I'm not going to discuss that here. There are absolute tutorials out there where it's like, okay, now go and you know, configure the following, you know, environment variables, then run Wireshark and Wireshark will, you know, basically uh, uh, through, you know, basically set up as a proxy will then then capture those keys so it can decrypt the track. And it's like, okay, got it. That's ridiculous, right? I say ridiculous. It, it's not a, it's not, it has use cases specifically like one that I use it for and have used before is, is, is malware analysis. But um, that is not a normal use case that we run into an investigation. So I'm going to kind of shove that off to the side here. Um, and then, of course, we already talked about GZIP compression for responses. That obviously can, uh, you know, can um, complicate things a little bit as well. So, okay. Um, so first off, we have a simplistic web shell found on the system, right? And, and I, I need to know more. I'm told I need to dive in and identify, uh, identify more. Now, I'm going to tell you here that right off the bat, this looks bad, right? Um, I am I am super concerned. Does anybody here, and, and if you do know, jump into the questions here, right? And I'll buy you a drink uh, next time we're back in, in person at a conference together, if you've got the right answer here. Why is this so concerning to me in a web shell? This specifically, like there's some other stuff, you know, the, the cat Etsy password, right, was obviously concerning. But this, why, is, why does this make me, make me squeamish? Any thoughts here? Yeah, somebody says path traversal, right? Um, it, it's not so much a path traversal as um, it's it's saying here that the command is is not at all obfuscated. It's it's download equals, and it's saying go download this file, right? Shows who's on the network, successful and failed. Yeah, I'm requesting off logs. Yeah, see, lots of people are like, and I see people dancing around this, but I'm going to go ahead and and, and cut off the. Uh, well, I mean, if you have any other guesses, go ahead and drop in here. I'm going to go ahead and answer the question here and say, this, my friends, is a file that for whoever, yeah, I see find users to brute force shows who is uh, on the network, logging in on the network. 
Yeah, I mean, that's all concerning. And that would be a great reason to make sure that random people can't just read that file, that random users can't just read that file. And this immediately strikes fear into me, right? Because I'm like, whoa, 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 why? Why is somebody reading that file? Because the web server should not be running as root. And this file should only be accessible by root. Houston, we have a problem. Now, if I only have log files, I'm left to try to draw conclusions here, right? Because it is, and it is worth noting here, right? That this, and, and the, forgive the line break here, but see the two and the zero, zero. It's a 200. That means that it's, it's successfully concluded, right? Well, okay, right? Now, what does success mean? Well, success means that there is a successful HTTP response, not necessarily that the download of the file was successful. What I do from here, right? If you remember the SANS Pickerel model of incident response, right? Patch infrastructure could have easily relegated losses or uh, let's see, preparation, identification, containment, uh, eradication, remediation, and lessons learned. See, I had to think for a second there. Um, but uh, thank goodness for mnemonics, right? Uh, but uh, basically, if, if I think about that, uh, you know, as I think about my containment, right? My containment changes a lot, right? Depending on whether the threat actor had root level permissions on the system and then what else they did from there on the system. My containment changes a lot here. So this is a great spot where packet capture is, is potentially going to save the day, right? So let's talk about why here. Oh, oh, I already talked about TCP versus follow HTTP stream. I do have a couple of slides here because I mean, who doesn't have slides coming into something like this? But forget the slides, right? Let, let's let's take a uh, let's take a harder look here. I'm going to say HTTP request. Quest. There you go. Okay. And so I'm looking for where do we grab the download? There we go. Download var log off log. And I'm going to go ahead here and then I'm going to follow my HTTP stream. Okay. So now we see pretty conclusively that the threat actor didn't get this. All right. And so because there's just no data there, right? You can see content length is zero, right? This isn't something like it just got truncated. We don't like there's a there's a glitch in the matrix. The matrix is coming, but there's a glitch in the matrix or something. It's none of that, right? Um, we see the content length specifically is zero. The threat actor probably didn't have permissions to get this. Whew. Okay, can I determine that purely from the web server logs? And by the way, again, you have the web server logs that I have the screenshots of if you're on the GitHub uh, repo. Uh, what do we see in the uh, in the web server logs here? Let's see, I was looking for my. Uh, oh, I, I killed the window. That would explain it. Okay, Give me one sec to get back to those logs. Yeah. No, that's the wrong index. Okay, uh, let's come here and we'll go to web shell. Um, and we're going to jump into the access log here. And, and again, if I were to look here and say, okay, well, you know, where do we see the download? Let's see. That was off log. Do here. Let's do control F or off log. There we go. It's taking me right to like surgical precision, right? To, um, you know, we could look at the content length return and we might infer that based on the length return, that, that probably wasn't the contents of the off log. All right, but you know, again, I'm I'm still kind of in the spot of better to see it in PCAP. And by the way, if that content point was larger, I'd want to know specifically what the threat actor saw, not what's on the system now. What did the threat actor see? And again, this is something the packet capture gives you. Now, I do want to highlight, right, that if you're not doing HTTPS decryption or TLS break and inspect, right, at your gateway, you're capturing a bunch of encrypted packets. You, you don't have this, right? You're gonna have to go rely on rely on your server log like you're seeing here, you, you don't get this, right? But I, I hope this highlights, uh, you know, at a, at a pretty decent level here, why packet capture is, is outstanding here, right? Because here I'm able to get to ground truth on what did the threat actor see. Now I'm gonna hop over here for just a second and say, okay, let's see, there were a couple of commands that were run. So there's a download, here's a command, who am I, right? Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead here and I'm gonna cheat and I'm gonna say frame, Contains, who am I? 
And so that, that's a total cheat. By the way, that is fraught with danger the frame contains. There's tons of ways to get false negatives on that. Be like super careful about using that, right? So this is one of these things where it's like you, you go to the circus and you see that guy like, you know, dancing around on the high wire and you're like, oh, cool, I'll go string up a rope in my backyard, right? And the next thing you know, you got a broken femur, right? That, that's what just happened there, right? So, so again, be careful around that, different encodings, like Wireshark may be able to decode and show it to you, but it's not raw in the frame. Anyway, you get the idea of it. But it's the cool Konami cheat code for shortcuts here. I'm gonna go and right click, I'm gonna say follow my HTTP stream again. And here, we indeed do see a return. It's a little bit different, obviously, than the, uh, Obviously, than the Git request that we saw before. Let's see, what was the output? Ba -dum -dum -ba -dum -dum. Oh, there we go. Dub 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 data. Right. Um, so again, it shows who the user is. We can actually see that there's been. Now again, I could go look and I could say who's the web server running as now, right? But again, this kind of ground truth lets me see what the threat actor saw. Um, by the way, when you're able to go back and do these reconstructions for executives, they don't like that they were breached. Obviously, nobody likes that but they do really get a kick out of when you see a threat actor make a typo or screw something back, I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Um, it, it's, it's pretty cool that they, they generally like that, at least in my experience. Okay, so more to play with on the web shell. Feel free to jump in and, and play around with that. Um, you know, bonus points if you can extract the, uh, the JPEG that got uploaded. In fact, there's two attempts to, uh, to upload a JPEG. Come on, there we go. Uh, there's two attempts to upload a JPEG, right? And uh, let's see, where are those? Oh, uh, so these are both post requests. I probably should highlight this because we didn't talk about posts before, right? So actually, I'm going to go with the first one that was unsuccessful. Yeah. Let's take a look at, and by the way, this is unsuccessful. And I, I do want to point this out that this file on this request never got stored on the system at all, right? But I, I did this intentionally to show you that it doesn't matter because all the file contents are still there. And so you can still extract those, right? Because the order of operations is that the upload started, right? And then the web shell said, okay, I've got the file. Now let me try to write it to disk. And then I was like, no bueno, and, and it didn't. And so, but I saw the payload, right? Which is which is pretty cool. A payload here is, is, is a, uh, a joke that somebody put together pre j um, long story doesn't matter, but uh, but but fun regardless, right? And it's safe for work. Um, so uh, anyway, so we see post, and then again, you can see here basically the data that gets pushed up. Uh, basically, the data gets pushed up with the post request, and I'll show another example of this later. Where we have different arguments, um, but here you can indeed see uh, basically that. Well, actually, here's some of the form data, right? So uh, name equals dir. That that's part of the uh, basically the variable that that worked up with the, uh, or basically that would have gone in the URI request um, with, or basically as an argument here, the themes.php with a Git request. Um, so here it's being put into the post request and separately, um, you know, we actually have uh, data um, and, and part of the here is you know, file to upload. The file name is freejake.jfif. Um, and then of course you have the content here, right? And so if you so desired, you could go and, and extract that and, and view a, a Photoshop masterpiece that I had nothing to do with, like seriously, I yes. Um, anyway. Um, so I, I'm the target of a lot of interesting photoshops, I guess. Um, so, okay, um, got that done. Uh, we've taken a look at a web shell. Let, let's pivot, right? I've got about 25 minutes left and I wanna cover three other points, say three other points, three other case studies um, with you. But good news, we're gonna move faster on these next case studies because we've already gone through HTTP, right? So um, what about a SQL injection attack? A researcher notified the organization that a web application is vulnerable to SQL injection and offers no further details. These are people that I want to yeet into the sun, right? Um, if we have a bug bounty, great, game on, right? Uh, report it through the bug bounty, and then you have obviously have to report details. And if we don't have a bug bounty, and you're like, hey, I, I found some vulnerability, contact me for more details, right? That is not ethical security research. Like if you're not gonna be like, hey, do you, do you offer bounty payouts before I give you info? Like that's, that's borderline extortion, I think, but hey, whatever. I'm not the lawyer. I'm just gonna tell you like, bottom line, uh, yeah, you are you do one of those with me. I, I promise to to forever uh, file 13 year resume, right? So, oh, and by the way too, not having DMARC configured on a, uh, basically on a domain um, is not a vulnerability. It's just a lack of configuration. That, that one drives me off the wall. These are big bounties, but that's what happened. 
So the threat hunting team analyzes the server log. They can't find any conclusive evidence of SQL injection. And let's take a look at why, right? So I wanna hop back here and we'll hop into the SQL injection example. And here we are in our IIS logs. Um, and, and I've obviously really, really, uh, you know, pared these, uh, pared these down. Now, I don't have to know too much about this to know that if, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna take for, let's just take for instance that, um, you know, the source IP address we've already identified as 204.1.3, right? And that's, that's why we filter down to these logs. If these are all the relevant logs that might be the SQL injection, right? Or the exploitation of the SQL injection vulnerability, um, then my friends, only two of these are good candidates, right? And, and conveniently, they are both, they are both the same name, right? Now, why are they the only two candidates? Do you have any thoughts around this? It's SQL injection. First off, the rest of these are Git requests. And if these Git requests, I should probably scroll over here, actually, right? So if these Git requests had uh, basically had arguments around them, game on, right? Like I'd be like, yeah, right? There's some parameters there, but I don't have parameters on those Git requests. So those aren't good candidates, right? Yeah, those aren't good candidates for uh, basically for the uh, you know, basically for the SQL uh, SQL injection, right? They're not good candidates at all. I've got somebody actually asking like, hey, where's the? Uh, I joined a few minutes late. Um, where are the uh, files? I just posted a link back in chat for GitHub. So um, yeah, and so somebody points out, uh, Terrence pointed out that it's it's the post request. Yeah, absolutely. And and the reason I'm focusing on the post request. It's not because post means SQL injection, it's because I don't see anything that could even be SQL injection in the Git request parameters, right? For, for what we've already narrowed this down to. And, and while I don't see anything on post, that's not conclusive because JavaScript, right? So game on there. Oh, now you can start to see, I hope like, oh my gosh, this is where PCAP totally matters, right? Because again, I've got the web server logs. I've got, and this is a very realistic scenario that happens. I've got somebody saying, hey, we've got SQL injection um, on your website and you're now narrowing it down. And of course you have to take that seriously, right? And you're being beat up by, you know, on high saying, is there SQL injection? If so, where we must protect our customers because we take privacy seriously. And, and you're like, it could be over here. Let's go, let's go test the, and so then I turn around with my red team testing, maybe do login. Right? And, and hoping that they find, but even if they don't find it, I can't say that there's no SQL injection. They're just like, I can't buy a fireproof safe, right? I use this example all the time. I can go buy a fire resistant safe, one that says that it is resistant up to, you know, let's say 1500 degrees for, for six hours or 30 minutes or whatever the, the ratings are. Obviously I don't know fire safe rating. Uh, but the point is even here, if I test, I, I can't say there's no SQL injection. I say we didn't find SQL injection. And now I'm kind of in the spot of like the big bounty guy or gal is like, you know, basically kind of holding me hostage a little bit here, right? So I'm like, eh, this is a great spot where we're, we're, we're or sorry, where packet capture is, is, is going to rule the day. So that said, let's go grab, go grab some PCAP. Okay. Um, so first thing I'm going to do here is I'm just going to say HTTP request method, request, oh, request dot method. Let's post. Because these are the two interesting ones, right? So I do want to right click here and I'm going to say, let's go follow that HTTP stream. Okay, so I got this going. Let's take a look at what got sent, right? So what gets what gets sent here? So come on, that's the Git. That's another Git. Where's the post? Post, post, there we go. Okay, um, so, oh, by the way, if you're like, hey, why are there multiple like back and forths here? Uh, what, what's happening now more and more is just the servers are keeping the socket open and, until the page request. So back in the day, you would open a socket for every individual request. That's dumb, right? If you're, if you're grabbing like images and CSS and JavaScript, and so very often you see, and this is an IIS server and it absolutely does this by default. Um, we'll hold that socket open for multiple requests. Here, the, the post being, uh, being one of them. Right. Um, so uh, let's see here. We have email. Uh, Jake at that percent forty is is if we can decode that doing just like we did before. That's the app um, and the password. Oh my gosh, that's a horrible password. By the way, or PW. We'll assume that means password, right? 
Uh, by the way, this this is one of the 25 reasons that you should absolutely, um, you know, uh, again, I, I can't can't stress emphatically enough. Do not do not do not log post variables because again, here's my password. Obviously, not my real password in plain text, right? Or a real password that, that I would use in, in plain text. So, okay, well that one wasn't interesting, right? Um, let's go ahead then and let's see if we can validate this with. Ding, ding, ding. Okay, and we will follow HTTP stream. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so um, if you're not familiar with with this, right? This this looks kind of this looks kind of iffy. Password equals. Okay, let's go ahead and copy that, and uh, we'll just go quickly and we'll cyber chef to this. Let's see, cyber chef. Ding. If you're not familiar with CyberChef, and there's lots of other ways to URL decode stuff, uh, URL decode, and we'll just drag that in there and we'll paste that in. And you can see now that that translates to uh, basically X um, or A equals A, right? So there was an opening quote here. Um, and uh, basically, we're using that so that we still have a valid SQL statement. Now, this is like, I'm not here to teach you SQL injection. This is SQL injection 101. What I'm showing you is I can now see that there indeed was actually a, a SQL injection here um, and, and a very interesting one or a SQL injection attempt, actually. But let's go and see, like, what did we, what did we win, right? What did the attacker, the threat actor win? And, um, I want to come down here a minute and, and, and highlight here for a moment or, or keep in, in frame um, that, uh, you know, it's, it's Jake at BreachQuest, right, is, is who logged in, right? But provided a password of, or I shouldn't say who logged in, the user account being specified is, right? Um, and uh, so anyway, provided the SQL injection payload as, as the password, right? And so then we see here, get account index, got it, okay. Looks like this was successful, right? Um, because there's something being returned, unless it argues with me and it's like, no, nope, that's, let's see, breach plus bank. And let's see if I can find welcome. Ah, and so a different person got logged in, unless I'm masquerading as somebody named Drew, um, that's actually my daughter. Uh, then, uh, and you can see here a different email. Um, no, probably not, right? So, so what happened here effectively is that um, by specifying that SQL injection, I've got a very interesting, because of the logic, right? The, the, the underlying vulnerability is SQL injection. But, but the way this one in particular works, it's effectively an authentication bypass and a really interesting authentication bypass where I can log in as other users. And if you're thinking about this in the context of, oh, I don't know, a bank, you could think, wow, that's highly impactful. So, so again, another spot where my log data just isn't showing me that, you know, what I need to see, but the packet capture is, right? And so again, if you're taking notes here, um, anytime I go and I brief back to executives and I say, hey, you know, there are some controls that we could deploy and they would make us so much better from a defensive or investigative posture standpoint. Anytime I bump up against something like that, I'm never in there going, PCAP or we're definitely going to be toast, right? I love to use examples like these without deep diving in. I just say, hey, in our current situation today, remember that time three months ago when, or probably was a week ago, right? When the big bounty person, you know, caused this big stir around a SQL injection vulnerability that was compromising a regulated data. And we did that big exercise where we came back and said, hey, as best we can guess, based on, or as best we can assess, based on all of the web server log data, we don't think there's an issue or there might be. Executives hate uncertainty, right? So I like to brief this as decision support. It just comes down to, hey, I'm not going to be like walking there with a you know, PCAP or didn't happen t-shirt on, right? Um, in fact, I should have worn that for this webinar. But um, anyway, the, uh, I'm not going to walk into the PCAP or didn't happen shirt, but I'm going to say, look, if this happens again and you want us to be able to conclusively answer, this is what it requires, right? So, so the requirement is that we need to do TLS break and spec. We need to have the packet capture. You may not need to store it for, I mean, how long you store it is, is obviously, you know, how far back do you want to be able to go back and, and analyze the stuff, but having something on hand, and this is something I bump up against with folks all the time too, where they're like, do you know how expensive that could be? I'm like, well, sure. I, I know how expensive uncertainty can be as well, right? I, I see people spend 
ridiculous amount of organizations spend ridiculous amounts of money because they're uncertain about something um, where they could have been certain had they spent substantially less money earlier. Anyway, um, bottom line here, right? I guess worth, worth mentioning is, is, you know, I just brief this as decision support, right? And say, hey, here are scenarios where, and you can take these scenarios and, and again, obviously you're not going to replay this whole thing to an executive, but you can kind of highlight because these probably parallel stuff you've been asked to investigate, right? Um, so bottom line here, I've seen folks go in with, uh, you know, basically taking life cycle replacement servers, like, you know, like old hardware and stand that up for packet capture for in the cloud. Um, you know, obviously I've seen some of the, you know, some folks set up uh, VPC, uh, VPC NAT gateways or, I can't remember the point there. Uh, but basically, a peering point on VPC. This is this is why I have a cloud architect. Um, but they uh, VPC, uh, you know, point the virtual private cloud so that they can basically capture transit gateway. That's what I was looking for, where they can capture all the traffic and it's just set up all to do that. Hey, rock on, right? You have those, uh, you have those options. So I'm gonna go ahead and clear off of the SQL injection side. There's more to look at in there, by the way. But hey, that's uh, that's for you to uh, for you to play with later. Uh, let's go, and we're gonna go grab next whatever my slide says next, because I don't remember which uh, which route we're going. Stored cross-site scripting, okay. So so now that this, this poor chump has logged into the website successfully at some point and says, whoa, uh, I got a problem. Now, listen, you know threat actors are not going to pop an alert box with, with cross-site scripting. This is purely here for some level of visual, right, uh, to show you. Um, I will never forget interviewing somebody who highlighted himself as a senior penetration tester. And I asked him to describe cross-site scripting to me. And he says, you know, that's the thing that makes the alert boxes pop. And I'm like, thank you so much for wasting my time. And that was the end of the interview. And so anyway, cross-site scripting is so much more than this, but the alert box um, does, make it, uh, does make it easy to easy for us visually to see. Now, obviously, there's a problem here. It's stored. I, I don't have anything in my, uh, basically in my variables here. Um, trust me, there's nothing in the post variable on the side. This is actually stored cross-site scripting. Although we already know how to go validate, right? Whether there's something in the post variable on the account index request. By the way, you probably saw before in the web server logs, those were get requests anyway, right? For the account index. So any, you, you'd see it there. It's not reflected that this, this is stored. Um, so I need to know when was the payload stored? And what are the vulnerable parameters, right? So, well, let's go take a look because I do want to fix this, obviously, right? Um, so, let's go and we'll grab the stored cross-site scripting PCAP file. Okay, um, I'm not going to go back into the web server logs to show you that they don't show you anything, but but they're there if you want to go look at them, right? So, um, but let's take a look here, right? So, first off, I'm going to cheat and I'm going to say frame contains XSS, right? Why? Because again, I have a cheat code here, right? I know that it pops up and says this is XSS, which means that's in the payload someplace. Now, if I didn't know this, right? Um, let's say that you know the report was, hey, users are being redirected to evilsite.com, then I'd be looking for evilsite.com, right? Now, if this fails, I'm not going to give up, right? If that search, the frame contains fails, I'm not going to give up. I'm probably going to be looking through my gits and my, my uh, git parameters, although those should automatically come up frame contains occasionally post doesn't for weird reasons. And anyway, long story short, um, we, we do have a hit here. Um, and notice here that it's in the account save profile. Okay, game on, right? So the account save profile. Well, let's go ahead then and we're going to follow, uh, go ahead and follow the HTTP stream. Okay. Uh, let's see here. So, <clears throat> oh. All right, just like rolled right past, right? Um, and let's see, I see a gzip, uh, cool, but uh, that was a, oh, that's a git. I need to go find the post, right? There's another git, account profile, and account save profile. So so two things, first off, uh, first off, wanna note here that, uh, you know, obviously we saw account profile a minute ago, uh, but here you see it as the referrer tag, right? Oh, by the way, if you're like, hey, referrer is misspelled, you are correct. It uh, turns out that it is misspelled, but it was misspelled in the RFC, so it's no longer misspelled unless you're using content security policy, which spells refer correctly with two R's. But that's, don't get me started there. So uh, moving forward here, we can see the refer where it came from, right? Now, the vulnerable, as it were, probably vulnerable processor, right, is whatever the endpoint that does the save profile is, right? But the page that the user went to, and this is important because 
sometimes a user will report something on a page, but the action's taken somewhere else. And so, anywho, um, we can see here that uh, with the account profile, Jake, and then last name is, oh, last name is script alert, right? Okay, got it. There's our JavaScript, right? So our JavaScript being, uh, uh, being inserted. And uh, okay, so that's on the profile page. So we've got that now. Um, let's go ahead then and we can determine is this successful or not. Right? Let's see. Yes, yes. I was looking for. Well, this is cool, right? Uh, in case you're you're looking here and you're thinking like, hey, how did that happen? That's a typo, right? So you can see, uh, by the way, here again, um, that uh, let's see, uh, should have had a response code of a 404 because again, it's a typo. Uh, but we see here then as this gets sent back down. Let's see, I was looking for the script alert. Uh, let's see. Of course, I'm not seeing what I was looking for there. I might have to control F to go find that. Oh no, here we go. Um, so sure enough, when I come back here, uh, then it does indeed show someplace my... Okay, well, uh, yeah. So again, we see here the, uh, this, is, uh, this is XSS, uh, but that's being submitted there, not the... I'm gonna have to go find where the actual payload... Actually, I have eight minutes left. I'm not gonna go find where the actual payload returns to. That is an exercise for you. Um, but indeed it does. Okay, so uh, let's see. Maybe four examples is a bridge too far. As a former paratrooper, you would think I would be like totally around a bridge too far, but hey, YOLO, right? Um, okay, so let's talk quickly about DOM XSS, right? So DOM XSS typically involves the use of data supply after a hash in the URL. This is uh, for a lot of HTML5, code highlighting, you name it, right? I do want to highlight here, though, that data after the hash is almost never stored in server logs. There's lots of reasons for this, uh, mostly because space, right? But there can potentially be some sensitive data, dot, 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 whatever. Bottom line here, this is a hard thing for us to track down, DOM-based cross-site scripting, for two reasons. One, we don't see the payload in the logs ever. Reflected cross-site scripting, at least I see the payload in the logs, right? Because it's, it, it's, I say Typically, it's a Git parameter, right? That, that's that's reflected back. That's not even being logged here. Well, that that doesn't help me, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, exploitation targets the users, not the server. There's no evidence of it on the server because cross-site scripting is is impacting our users. The vulnerability is on our server. It's it's our duty to fix it, right? But but the exploitation is not targeting us explicitly. Packet capture is our best option. You want to show you here, right? Again, we see this is XSS. Okay, so good news, right? Like no doubt that's there. Notice here the hashtag referred by, right? Um, you know, and again, the hashtag there uh, effectively is is a way for you to go past additional data or code highlight or you know whatever to the page that you don't need to be logged explicitly, right? And again, there's there's lots of uh, well, yeah, it doesn't matter for the, all the reasons and the web standards why this is useful or not. Bottom line is it is a thing and it's something that you will bump up against if you haven't already. Now, I do want you to note here, this is the relevant, like, this is the actual uh, server log for that request that delivered across that scripting payload to my user, right? There's nothing there, right? There's, there's no uh, query parameter, there's no URI parameter, there's nothing extra specified, there's just nothing there. Let's go ahead to the packet capture because folks, unsurprisingly, right, if I'm using this as an example, we can indeed see this, right? Um, so I want to like right click on this as if like Wireshark's going to open options. It's like the only option, right? Um, so, right? and so I go ahead and I take a look here and say, okay, HTTP request. And remember, uh, it was a uh, it was in an about, right? So let's do a follow. By the way, here too, notice Wireshark's kind of following that pattern, right? It's not showing us the hashtag either. Um, I don't know if you want to call that a problem or uh, whatever. Actually, that might not be the right one. Nope, it is the right one. How about this? And frame contains. There you go. It's the only one. Right? Uh, so we're going to follow and we'll follow the HTTP stream. OK. Um, so <clears throat> let's see. Do I have this? 
Dum dum dum. There's my do login. Dum 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 dum. dum. This is always fun trying to find like the thing you're looking for. <laughs> looking for the referred by. Come on. Come on, Huckleberry. Come on, Huckleberry. Okay, well. I have a whopping four minutes left here. I was going to go find this in in the PCAP, right? But um, let me go ahead and wrap up here because I I'm going to burn my burn my last couple of minutes or otherwise. So um, yes, let, let me go wrap up here. It's there, it's, it's there, right? Um, but uh, so demo the demo deities are not with me. Um, but let, let me go ahead and wrap up here and say, look, first off, HTTP is a very rich data source for investigators, um, and and you sh you should probably already know this, right? Uh, we are moving to an increasingly web amplified or whatever you want to call it here, you know, world. Um, I, I've just been uh, introduced in the last few weeks to uh, progressive web applications, right? Which PWAs, which means something different than like responsive web applications. And I'm, I'm like, holy goodness. Okay. So we, we see then more and more moving to uh, basically moving to the web, right? Um, it, it's everything. I think about like all the stuff on my phone. Uh, you know, it's it's all these mobile apps really are, I mean, the vast majority of them are, are doing HTTP requests on the back back end, HTTPS in most cases, uh, but to, to go grab uh, go grab data, they try to store very little, right, on, on my endpoint, um, and uh, my endpoint, my phone, uh, and uh, handset, right, and, and try to store most of that, uh, most of that in the cloud, right, so, so we will see more HTTP, I don't like to make lots of, you know, lots of technology predictions age very poorly, but the one that I'm confident in is that we'll see more HTTP rather than less um, in, in the future. So um, I think that's important. Uh, I, I will also mention that web server logs don't have adequate information to assess the impact of an exploitation attempt. Something I deal with all the time, right? Um, can't tell you how often during an incident response, it, well, not how often, it's every time. I, I can't think of, actually, I can think of one or two, but I can count on one hand the number of times that I've gone into an incident response and, and everybody there has had realistic expectations about what we are going to be able to get out of our web server logs. That's problematic to me. That means that we have lots of folks that really haven't thought through this a lot. Um, it, it's, it's not that they said, oh my gosh, packet capture is worthless. In most cases, they said, hey, we don't need the packet capture because I have web server logs. And what I wanted to highlight for you today is that I have multiple instances now, four different uh, case studies where the web server logs absolutely are inadequate for us to work through and identify what indeed happened. Were there exploitation attempts? Were those exploitation attempts successful? And then finally, I want to note here that if TLS decrypt is enabled, you can go and grab your command, uh, command and control trap. Now, it's very common that TLS decrypt is, is kind of done for free um, in our, uh, <clears throat> basically in, in a lot of our enterprise, uh, you know, web applications. Uh, because, you know, depending on where your tap point is at, right? Because oftentimes you have a load balancer um, that sits in front of uh, multiple different servers. And so if you tap on the backside of that load balancer, usually the load balancer is uh, doing basically, it's the TLS endpoint, right? Um, and so if you tap right behind the load balancer, um, then you're getting, and take the packet capture there, um, for instance, with an end ace probe, uh, you're getting all of the, uh, I mean, the tap is, is gonna be something different, but store it on the end ace probe, um, then uh, basically then you're getting the TLS decrypt for free. Um, and, and if you have that outbound, you can certainly decrypt um, certainly some, uh, you know, some command, if you're doing TLS break and inspect outbound, you can decrypt some command and control traffic, but if you get a web shell in one of your systems, right, you can then see from an impact standpoint exactly what happened, right? Because it's, it's, I mean, say magic, but it, it, it's pretty cool. So anyway, that's all the time I have. I'm going to hand it back over to Carol to close up the webcast. Thank you so much for being with me today. And I apologize for that last, uh, not being able to find the payload there in the last three minutes, but hey, such is life. Anyway, folks, thank you so much. And thank you to Endace. Carol, your show. All right. Thank you so much, Jake, for your great presentation and to Endace for sponsoring this webcast, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care.
and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.